Okay, well, we're here with Bob Mead, my friend Bob Mead, and Bob is a very well-known realistic fly tire. Kind of talk with Bob and get some of his history about how he got into this and, you know, where he's going with it now and what the future holds. So, Bob, how did you first get into tying the realistic flies? I used to go to the track. I had a, at the harness track, a $200 place bet thing, about the time I was uh, in my 20s. And the very first time I, I went up and I, I bet, horse won, I had 200 to place and it paid 380 to place. That was 180 clear. From working it out, I had an uncle that go both Saratoga tracks, and uh, it worked. And then, so he had a mathematical system for no, betting the horses. I, he said, "Here, you like to figure stuff out. See what you can do with this." Now you got to realize, 180 dollars was about twice what I grossed in a week at PE. Yeah. Everybody goes by the final time, and I was going by how they got away, where they're lying. Every length behind is a fifth of a second. And if they, I tried to find what the, who was going to be in the lead, and it worked. Paid 280 to win, but it was $80 clear. You know, on a GE, I was making 97.50 something like that yeah. a week. Trouble with gambling is the next best thing to gambling and winning is just gambling. And I'd start going over to all the local bookie joints, Johnny D's and <laughs> Mesa's on John's newsroom there, and uh, the other guy over on South Avenue, Legs to Coco. And I met a lot of interesting characters. And then in August, I said, Well, you know, I'm, this is the second year I'm going to start going to the flat track, but I was smart enough to only take like 30 bucks in with me. Uh, I, it's hotter than the devil because it's August. And I'm sitting out on a bench because I just didn't want to be inside even though it, you're out of the sun. But So I sat near a tree and all the green slatted benches and I'm just sitting there I'm looking over to the morning tele, telegraph, I think it was called. It's a big newspaper. And uh, I'm just basically going to pick a horse by its name and just because it's just there for fun. And this big heavy guy comes over towards me, and I was on this bench by myself. And he says, Hey, kid, anybody sitting there? And I said, No, no, no. And I switch over. Horses start going to come out. And he says, Hey, hey, kid, uh, save that seat for me. I want to see the ponies come out. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking what my wife had just said to me the day before. She says, if you don't get a real job, we're not getting married next April 29th. And this is how I know exactly when I, when I tied. And uh, this, this was 1966. And I, one night when I, after I tried this out that first year, and it hit. And I, I, was, I, was, I only lost twice, though, the whole season. And then I thought, how do I do this? I love this. You know, in the winter time, I, I go work as a short order cook or something. And uh, so anyway, we had, uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm going out, and you know how your pants bunch up here and yep. by your knee? And I see a little twig sticking out. I go, where the heck did that come from? And I straighten out. I'm staring at the ground thinking of what my wife said. And it's a walking stick. I hadn't tied in two years. All my stuff was was in these uh, old ammo boxes my uncles had given me, these dark olive ones, and with a lot of mothballs. And boy, was I sorry I did that. And I found the stuff. It was up in the attic. And I uh, took it out. And boy, what a whiff of mothballs. And I took porcupine quills and condor, which was legal then. And I made a walking stick. And uh, turkey wing quills dyed brown. And I used hackle stems for the legs, which I tied the biots to, thicker on the top and then smaller going down. I used some I made all brown, other ones I made uh, green on top and then brown. And uh, I have no idea why that set me off into realistics, because how often do you even see a walking stick, let alone how often does one fall on a trout stream? 
I mean, not I've, very often. I, 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 I mean, I've seen them go after like somebody's cigarette butt. So I know they go after almost anything if there's not much is floating down. And the only other one I know within a, a two week period when I did was the praying mantis. And that's because I, I did what my wife said. She told me she was already working as an operator at the phone company in New York Tell. And so she said they're hiring. And I went over and went to climbing school. I was a lineman, a splicer, and then a troubleshooter. And somehow I got into uh, troubleshooting where all the overtime was. We're running out of splicing work. They said, um, you're going over as a helper over to LIT, low insulation testing, but it's, we call that line in trouble. Because once the installer proved outside, they give it to us to go find where the squirrel bit the hole or it got cracked or whatever. Well, I went in and uh, I had got a bucket truck, which I liked. I didn't mind climbing, but... And the, uh, the whole thing was this Wheatstone Bridge was in this little beautiful box, dark wood. And what happened was... There was one with a red tag on it, and I said to the boss, Joe, I says, you throwing that out, that Wheatstone Bridge? And he goes, you know what that is? I says, yeah, it's a Wheatstone Bridge. You take Murray's and Varley's and you strap it to some good wire, and you measure it, find out where trouble is in wire. So I got that box, and I got the, because anytime anything laying dead on the road was fair game. My wife didn't like it. But I always kept gloves and burlap bags in in, mm -hmm. in the trunk, and uh, I picked up a porcupine one time, and a lot of I use a lot of their stuff all the way up to now. Uh, I just started tying, and I didn't think anything of it. It was just a lark. I never thought I'd tie another one, and I had joined Trout Unlimited. And uh, I made the mistake of bringing one in, <laughs> and like five years in a row, it got the highest price in the auction, and it was getting like 500 bucks and stuff. I go, what? But before that, uh, I, well, I met Dick Tallure there, and uh, he and some other guys suggested me for a book, The Art of the Trout Fly, and uh, so I had a little exposure. And then later on in the 80s, I sent four flies to Fly Tire magazine, and they called me up, Dick Surratt, and asked me if I wanted to write a column, which is something I always wanted to do, write. You know, it was oh, always on the union newsletter, the high school uh, newsletter, the or, or paper, and same thing in college. And it was like, wow, and all I can finally do after all these years what I really want to do. And so... Word got around, because there was a picture of it in there, it got written up in the book review in the New York Times, uh, and here you got all these deadies and uh, Wolf, Lee Wolf and everybody, and, and, you, and they picked my name out <laughs> to say, you know, praying man, it belongs in a museum of natural history, not in a trout stream or something like that. Yeah. I never fished one. But when the magazine went out, this guy called me from, uh, I think he was in Chicago, and he said, uh, I'm trying to get every fly that's in the book. Uh, how much do you want for the praying mantis? And I don't want to time their pain in the neck. They take like 23 hours. And, but a lot of it's me, too. Yeah. You know, I just, yeah. I, I, I'll sit and tie for four hours, and i got to get a break. And then that... 20 minute break turns into a two hour break. But I started getting asked to go and tie at clubs, to tie at other TU chapters at their banquets, and, and it grew. And I got uh, a lot of ma email, well, like fan mail. And uh, I didn't know what to tell this guy because I really didn't want to make another one right then. I was working on a grasshopper and a cricket and some other things. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to scare him off. Uh, this was before to you. <laughs> uh, 
was getting uh, big prices. <laughs> I said, well, it's $200. He says, great, make me two of them. I go, what the hell did I just do? You know, I said, I don't want to make two, Excuse let alone yourself. one. Full-time week's worth of work. If you can, yeah, if, you know, if, if he could wait six months, because I had, was, had to make some other flies for an article for Italian magazine at one point and uh, English, I can't think of the name of it. Although by the time I was writing for uh, this one in England and another one over here, and I can't think of the name of it, I was writing on collecting. And I just like to use natural materials. I didn't like to use, you know, I'd use it a little bit for the eyes, melted mono mm -hmm. or something, and then I'd, I'd uh, cover them up a little bit with some stuff. But... Uh, the mosquito is uh, porcupine quill for the driller. Uh, it's got a little little eyes, mono eyes. The legs are uh, porcupine guard hairs, and I did I do it on a oh, living nymph hook, the English hook company that, that sold it. And now they're back doing them again because. I, and I tie it backwards, so where the bend of the hook is, is where the driller goes down over the bend. Everybody says, well, why don't you just straighten that bend out a little bit? You know, as a long, yeah. longer little shank with a little turned up eye. And it, mayflies, several of them, green drake and um, pale morning dun, and uh, caddisfly, cricket, grasshopper, and I think a bumblebee. And the, f the funny thing is, uh, this show, Royal Pains, uh, and the guy who produced it was involved with some fly tire before when he needed bugs or something. I don't know who, maybe Ted Niemeyer or something, I never got to ask him. And, uh, but they, their prop office was in Brooklyn, and they'd call me on a Wednesday or a Thursday late in the day, and it would have to be in their office in Brooklyn no later than noon on Tuesday, which meant, okay, I'll never get it mailed Monday. I'm going to have to mail it next day mail uh, Monday. I'm not going to get it to them yeah. Monday. Uh, and I'm not driving down there to deliver it. You know, <laughs> It was worth an extra money to send it next day mail. But the problem was they wanted a black widow spider. They wanted a yellow jacket, and they always wanted three. And when I did the uh, yellow jacket, I, I finally, hey, it's a prop. And then I cut the bend of the hook off, and the eye is hidden. But there's, there's these little, uh, little uh, rods of thing. And uh, I cut a little bit off three sides and just a little bit flat on the bottom but just near the end and when I then I, I, I flash it with a with a lighter and then I wet my finger actually I used to do this <laughs> my so wet my thumb but then I said no this, I need I need the little saucer a little thing of water there and that made it flat on the bottom this was a spearmint and it isn't that flat. And it made it curve just a little bit. And they worked the point, but not to a point point, just to a, a, a dull point like that, but more flattened out. So. See, like that one. See how that, feel the bottom, how you, it's, it's flat. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I would hooked into it, and in the beginning, I, I would fish some, not the walking stick or the praying mantis or the water scorpion or anything that was really confusing, but beetles, ants, mayflies, I would fish them, you know, because that's what I was doing. The other things was just a lark, and then people started wanting them. And